Yo, good morning. Welcome to the MLB Live Before a Lot right here on the Stochastic YouTube channel. Dave Locke and Greg Ehrenberg. Four game slate should have been a five game slate. Got a game postponed. Four game main slate. First pitch at 1230. Been some weird starts this year, like with just no night games. But here we are breaking it all down. If you're playing baseball today, this is the place to be. And really the only semi-significant slate that we've got. So we're going to talk about it. What's up, brother? Yeah, and uh, actually, just for clarity, twelve twenty is the uh, time oh, right. of the first pitch, which yep. it, it doesn't. Not not that I'm uh, trying to uh, be a pain in the ass about it or anything, but just so nobody's sitting there and like waiting to upload lineups at the wrong time. But yeah, it's a weird it's a weird slate for sure. Now we have three games. Brewers Reds just got postponed. Okay, I was about to say that it is a four game slate that I expect to be a three game slate. So now we've got that information that that game is. Uh, not going to be playing. Let's see. Is that confirmed? Yeah, confirmed. Uh, Brewers Reds postponed. So we're going to have to rerun everything through the Sims here because, uh, yeah, our ownership and everything is about to update. But, yeah, going to make for an interesting slate when we only have three games. We should get ownership updated soon as well. And for some of these small slates, I find them very fun to play for baseball. Like two games is a little bit too small, but three, four games for baseball – actually is a lot of fun. I enjoy these slates more than I do for, say, basketball because there's a lot of leverage. There's a lot of ways to manipulate some of the ownership. Yeah, absolutely. This game throws a wrench into the works, though. Freddie Peralta was getting almost 60%. I mean, like a great – obviously not a good park, but the strikeout matchup was elite there. You're taking a 59% on DraftKings own percent owned pitcher that had 41% top two probability off of the slate, Greg. So – you know, obviously things are going to move a lot when you're taking four games down to three, but with Peralta out, now you've got Hunter Brown. You have John Gray against Oak. John Gray might be 80% owned at this point. Well, so the other thing that's going to be weird, especially for DraftKings purposes, the, the salary. We don't have any expensive pitchers, really. So Freddie Peralta was going to be massively owned because he was $8,800 and there's no other payout pitchers. I do wish this news came out a little bit later just because I was planning on fading this game anyway. And yesterday I faded Hunter Green due to weather and it ended up working out for me. Not for the reasons I thought, though. He just sucked yesterday, but I faded the game thinking he was going to score zero fantasy points because of the rain. And then he just ends up giving up like seven earned runs. Uh, but here now that we don't have Freddie Peralta, we have one pitcher on the entire slate on DraftKings. It's priced over 8K. That is Brady Singer, $8,200. And he's pitching against the Houston Astros. Then over on FanDuel, we have Singer's actually all the way at 10300 which is a super weird price tag for him. But Brady Singer could end up being popular on FanDuel at 10300 against the Astros just because there's nobody else to pay up for. Brady yeah. Peralta was $9,900. The gap between the most expensive and the second most expensive pitcher on FanDuel is $2,900. That's nuts. And Singer's been stellar to start the season. There's no denying that. Also, if I, you know, if I were thrust into or forced to to throw a pitcher in against the the Astros, at least he's a righty, because you know you throw you're throwing lefties in there against the Astros, that gets pretty ugly pretty quick. But yeah, look, you're gonna have to make some tough decisions. I agree though; these abbreviated slates can actually be a lot of fun. Do you take a different perspective on stacking with these though? Right. I got, you know, on these slates where you've got eight, nine, 10 games, Coors Field, Arizona, six run totals, you know, every day that we have a like seven, eight, nine game slate, you have at least three or four teams with five plus run totals. At least this season, that's what that's the case. And this is April and March. Wait till you get to the summer. Things look a lot different. What about on a slate like this? Yeah, I'm really interested to see what the Sims end up showing when I run stuff through it for a three game slate. The number one biggest difference is going to be is that I know that the Sims are going to give us some lineups that have hitters against their pitchers. I know you asked me more about stacks, but one thing that's going to be a massive difference uh, about even a three-game slate relative to a four- or five-game slate is you are going to have some more lineups that are going to have maybe a one-off hitter against one of the pitchers in your lineup. Uh, as far as stacking options, what is going to change is typically my lineups are not exclusively five-man stacks, but I found that they're predominantly five-man stacks still on the Sims for larger slates. But I do think for a smaller slate, we're going to see more lineups where it's like, hey, a 3-3 stack is popping up as being plus EV with a couple of one-offs. 
just because there's only so many lineup combinations that you could make given the limited options. So it's going to make more individual lineups show up as positive top ROI lineups, even if it is in a four or five man stack. It could be two three man stacks with a two man or something like that. So it's going to create some more uh, interesting and unique combinations of players. Yeah, makes sense. We'll wait for the uh, the data to update. Only so much we can do when we get that news right now. But happy to have you guys with us. Take a single second if you haven't done so yet. Hit that thumbs up. Tone for your sins here on a Thursday. I guess it's still morning. Yeah, Thursday morning. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that thumbs up. Goes a very long way for us here in combating the uh, YouTube algorithm. But it helps. I promise. It does. And we appreciate that in advance. OJ Simpson has since passed. Do you think he'll find the killer? I don't know, man. Days like today, I'm missing Norm McDonald, though. That would have been wild. <laughs> the, the, well, so other, another thing that's pretty crazy about uh, OJ passing away is if you go to his Twitter account, he, uh, first off, a uh, fantastic Twitter follower he was, is he put out a video like a month and a half ago, I want to say the last one he put up was, maybe it was two months ago, where he did mention that he was having health issues, but physically he looked fine. He looked healthy. So whatever cancer he had must have been pretty rapidly advancing because like just from the eye test, he physically looked healthy a couple of months ago. And then, uh, then he passed away today. So we lost one of the, the best accounts on Twitter. Was it cancer? Yes. Is that what they said? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, he, he didn't announce that he died from cancer, but family members did. That would be that would be even wilder. Another twist to the OJ story. <laughs> Beyond the grave. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, people got real mad at me for <laughs> actually. I'm not even gonna get into it. Um, uh, no, I think you should get into it. I'm interested. No, he's innocent, dude. He's innocent. He's innocent. He didn't do anything. But the Norm Macdonald at the ESPYS is one of the greatest lines ever, and the audible gasp from the crowd as he said that. Was. You mean to tell me you don't think that he stole his memorabilia? <laughs> no, I know he did because that was on security camera. <laughs> he came in there with an entourage and they just jacked everything and ran out. But anyway, let's talk some baseball here. So now the only three games you have, Mets and Atlanta, you've got no Minnesota, no Detroit, no Milwaukee, no Cincinnati. You have Houston, Kansas City, and then Oakland, Texas. Yeah, so that's significant when you've got Texas as a minus 185 money line favorite. Uh, Astros minus 135 on the road. Uh, and then Atlanta minus 170 at home. But, Greg, we look at some of these pitchers. Jose Quintana, so you've got a lefty. I'm not saying Quintana is bad because he's not. But he's also not a particularly high upside option, especially going up against a slew of power-laden righties that don't strike out at a heavy clip. Um, and then Alan Winans on the other side of that game, Hunter Brown, Brady Singer, J.P. Sears against Texas, and then John Gray against Oakland. A lot of people are going to get funneled to John Gray in this spot. Yeah, and I'm also uh, doing some manipulation into the contest generator and the Sims tool right now so that I could build a set of lineups for myself that does not have that Milwaukee and Cincinnati game into it to kind of get an idea for what I think the ownership is uh, going to end up being projected as. And then I can see what kind of manipulations I make end up being uh, relevant to what our actual uh, numbers end up being when everything updates here. But yeah, as far as the pitchers go, uh, John Gray was already projected to be very popular to your point, Lofty, who's projected for 44% ownership over on DraftKings. FanDuel, not quite as much. He was projected for 17% ownership. But I do expect him to be the absolute chalk of the slate now. We did have that 60% ownership going to Freddie Peralta. I don't think it goes to one guy just because he was in a price tier of his own. But the way I'm thinking of it right now is that, that uh, the 60% exposure that was going to Freddie Peralta probably just gets divvied up roughly amongst all of the remaining pitchers proportional to what their existing ownership already was. So with that in mind, I think John Gray probably ends up being somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% owned now. So do I. And and I think ultimately everyone's probably going to get some ownership. Like I, I don't think anyone's just going to be dead as far as, uh, as far as ownership, even, even Quintana. It's funny. We, I just saw a comment in chat from, from, uh, What's up, Arkansas? I said, I'm playing Quintana, even though he'll probably get smacked. 
Yeah, it's tough. I mean, look, he's not a bad pitcher. He's just not a great fantasy pitcher, right? Like last season, 18.8% K rate in almost 80 innings pitched. This year, through his first couple of starts, 17% strikeout rate. Just not something you're going to get a lot of. 5% swinging strike rate so far this year. Only 22% called plus swinging strikes. It's only two starts, but last year wasn't a whole lot different. If you're getting a good game from Quintana at this point, Greg, you're either just running so hot with called strikeouts, which is possible, or he's going deep into the game and he's preventing runs. He can do it. He he can go six innings, one run, four strikeouts, and you'd be fine in a situation like that, particularly today. Um, you are just You just kind of need him to be – infallible like he can't be making big mistakes because he can't make up for it with strikeouts yeah or every pitcher on the slate sucks today that as well just sucks less than other yep. guys so there's a scenario here and so also i i ran everything through the contest generator through the uh sims tool remove the milwaukee cincinnati game and for reference john gray ended up showing up with uh 57 percent oh, good guess. Good in guess. the uh, contest generator from that uh but as far as Quintana, he did end up being the lowest owned starting pitcher at 18%. Uh, that's also the exact amount that I got to him, got to him in 18% lineups. Uh, but as far as the pitching options go on this late, it's going to be hard to say just outright if you guys are playing like 150 lineups that you can't play somebody because all the pitchers who are starting are in play on a three game slate. But Quintana is the pitcher I have the least exposure to of every available option. Yeah. I mean, you okay, so hold on. How much Sears do you have? Yeah, so JP Sears is uh unfortunately currently my most rostered starting pitcher. And I came in way under to John Gray. And a lot of this now is just kind of manipulating ownerships. And when you got a pitcher like JP Sears, who's projected for the second least amount of ownership here. Now that could end up changing once ownership updates, which I assume is gonna happen in the next few minutes, if it's like wildly different than what I got to here, then I'll rerun everything and change it. But there's a couple things to like about JP Sears. Most notably, every single point matters on a three game slate. If Oakland happens to win this game, which is not the most likely scenario, but that's not always what we care about for tournament purposes. If Oakland wins, those are going to be fantasy points John Gray does not get that J.P. Sears can get. It matters more for FanDuel purposes than it does for drafting. It still matters for DK, though. And that is a little bit of leverage that's getting to J.P. Sears as my current most rostered pitcher. With that in mind, then, how much Atlanta are you getting to? Let's see. What are my because if Sears, if Sears is your highest rostered pitcher then you're probably getting underweight on Texas stacks. Yeah, so my top projected lineups, also it's way different because as I'm looking through my lineups compared to what they would normally be, kind of this is what you're speaking on before, Lafay, about how my stacks would look different, is I have a lot of lineups that are like 3-2-2 two, two stacks, 4-3 yeah. stacks. So my five-man stack exposures, it's way different than what I would normally see out of my lineups, but it, it's its a different slate than we typically play. So it is getting me to much different lineups than I normally would. As far as Atlanta, I get to a bunch of these guys as uh, one-offs. My most stacked team, though, is the Oakland A's, and that is just because of the amount of ownership that is going to John Gray. All right, another question then. How much... Are are you getting a lot of pit, a hitter versus pitcher? Might not be easy to just look up real quick, but yeah, um, I can tell from eyeballing it. The answer is some, but it's not like stacks against my pitchers. It's some, it's some one offs. Uh, yeah, no, no, not like, stacks. Of course not. Yeah, I'm just kind of eyeballing it and looking at my top projected ROI lineups in the Sims, and I do notice that I have some individual lineups that are you know, a pitcher against one of the hitters that he's facing. It's a little hard for me to discern like what percentage of lineups it is though. I'm just looking at all of these pitchers right now, given what we know. And I think you probably, well, first of all, 
you're probably getting a lot of Sears because what's the point of paying almost what, what fifteen, seventeen hundred dollar more dollars more for, for Quintana. Some of these guys are, everyone's in a, not everybody, but most of these guys are in pretty unenviable spots. How much singer though? Cause singer's the one guy that stands out to me is just like a, all right, $8,200. He's not, elite but he's been good i think the strikeout rate per, is probably a little bit inflated but this kind of stands out as one of those spots where singer could end up being the, the top overall pitcher on the slate yeah it, it's certainly possible uh, i do think he looks better on DraftKings than FanDuel. like no surprise if you see what singer's price point is on FanDuel. that rostering him at over 10k it's it's a lot to ask for him I do think that I'm going to come in underweight to the field on Singer because I'm underweight to him at the moment in my first run here. But then also, it's if if I'm going to be going cheap at pitcher, I do have some lineups that are leaving a lot of salary on the table. But it's not like all of the lineups I have in here are leaving two, three thousand dollars in salary on the table. So the individual hitters that I'm getting a lot of as one-offs, it is coming from the Atlanta Braves and the Houston Astros. And that does prevent me from getting to some of the pitchers going up against them because while it's okay to have lineups that we were talking about before, they might have one of your individual hitters against the pitcher, not necessarily when it's like two or three from an individual spot. So uh, Brady Singer is not somebody who I'm going to be getting to a whole bunch. I'm also really skeptical of his performances so far this year. So am I. It, it's, it's such an outlier from what he did last year. He's pitched 13 innings this year. His strikeout rate to what you had said before, it is higher than it was last year, but his velocity isn't up. There isn't a lot to indicate that all of a sudden he should be a guy who's all of a sudden striking out nearly 30% of the hitters he faces. So he had an 18.9% K rate last year. It's 29.2% this season. Let's see if there's, yeah, velocity slightly down, pitch mix. Well, here, here's the one the here's, here's the one thing I've noticed, though. He's throwing the four-seamer, and he's throwing less of the two-seamer. And he's getting 10% whiff rate on the four-seamer this year, which isn't, you know, it's not stellar. It's not like he's throwing gas. But that is, if I was just looking at to see what in the pitch mix is different, he his pitch mix is verifiably different than it was last year. So uh, he added a sweeper too. So d is that enough of a difference that he's going to go out there and have like another ten strikeout game? Probably not. But he he has at least made some changes to his repertoire. Yeah, I did notice that like the his slider usage is the same. His changeup usage looks about the same. But yeah, to your point, it looks like he had a sinker that's maybe being reclassified as a fastball, or maybe he's just kind of changing that up a little bit. But I don't know. It's hard for me to think that all of a sudden he's a guy who's going to be striking out way more hitters as a result of that. Let me see also if we have a, a real ownership update. As By the way, to, while you look yeah. for that, I don't, I don't disagree with you. What we wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't a three game slate. Like, Singer against Houston would look far less appealing uh, in, if this were a larger slate. But I I, I actually think he looks – you know, if, if I'm sitting here and we're both kind of skeptical, obviously I want to see what ownership looks like. Did we get an update yet? Yeah, we do have an update. Singer is 30% owned now, and John Gray, 61%. So Nailed it. Actually, what I, had, what I had in here that I was kind of – just like a janky way of manipulating some of the data ended up being like pretty close to what the actual numbers are, but I'm still going to rerun everything just with uh, actual ownership instead of me guessing. Really. We have three guys that are the same ownership right now. Wine and singer JP Sears. I guess I look at it like this, Greg, we're both skeptical that Brady singer is as good as he's looked thus far. But when you're devoid of other options, maybe you uh, maybe you eliminate some of that skepticism and ride with like, wait, what if he is this good? Listen, I've been wrong many times on guys that I was like, this can't be sustained. And then they do. And you're like, whoa, he's actually pretty good. Maybe that's not the case with Singer. But what if he is? Like, What if, what if this guy's actually, you know, what if these adjustments to his pitch mix actually make enough of a difference to where he's good?
Uh, yeah. I mean, if that's the case, then I probably want a very good DFS slate. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it, dude. I get it. I'm just trying to look at it from both angles. You know what I mean? Yeah, and... I got you. I got you. And yeah, looking through the all the ownerships for you guys, by the way, I'm surprised Quintana is now projected for 12% ownership. I think that Mark will end up being slightly higher than that. Not like significant. Not saying I think that Quintana comes in like 25% owned. I would be a little surprised if he actually ends up being only 12%. I think he ends up being maybe a little bit closer to 20% just because the options are so thin. For reference, we got a question in our Discord channel from Einsteinium. And as you guys know, anybody who signs up for any MLB package, whether it's the lineup channel or the Sims package, it gets you access to our Discord channel. But Einsteinium asked, would we consider rostering a reliever today? That's one of the reasons that I assume that Quintana can only be 12% owned. Because if people are considering rostering relievers today, you're just very thin on options. There are going to be people who just click on Quintana or just people who are like myself playing 150 lineups. And it's hard to just forego one of the only six available pitchers there are on a slate. To the question for my sign, though, I would not roster a reliever today. No, you're just going to roster 50% JP Sears at 5K. Probably. Let's see. I'm about to... About to run everything again. I mean, ultimately, what like. what's the advantage to playing a reliever? That's not a rhetorical question. That's a, that's an actual question. Like I, that everybody else is terrible, and you're getting a, a supreme discount. And I say that because there's it's not like like John Gray is super cheap. JP Sears is close to what you'd be paying for a reliever anyway. Uh, there's several. There's a handful of guys that are already really discounted. So there's three benefits to playing a reliever. One of them doesn't matter to this slate. One of them is the price. Doesn't the pricing is the salary is like irrelevant for this. Yeah, it doesn't this matter. Point. So for today, that goes out the window. The other advantages: number one, very low ownership. You are going to be getting a pitcher that people are not rostering. By the way, also my answer to Einstein is no. I wouldn't play a reliever on the slate. And we could talk more on that in a second as well. But no. Uh, wouldn't play a reliever. The advantages are you're getting somebody really low ownership. The field isn't going to be on. The other potential advantage too is that there's generally very minimal risk of that reliever scoring zero fantasy points. Whereas there's an unrealistic but possible scenario where there are not two starting pitchers on this slate that score positive fantasy points. Now, here's the problem I have with rostering a reliever. We do have three. We do have three games that are going to be played today. The idea that every single starter in those games all scores negative fantasy points, or that you don't get multiple of them with positive fantasy points, like that's kind of the path that's needed for a reliever to be in a winning lineup today, or just you get like some random reliever who whatever pitches three innings and just is a stud in those in those innings. Uh, I don't think it's very realistic that given the options we have, they're like all negative fantasy point scores. Yeah, for sure. Looking at the top two probability, too, in the top uh, pitchers tool, we have Gray at 40%, Brown at 39%, Sears at 24 clearly a, a, just a salary relief play, Singer at 35 Winans at 36 and Quintana at 26 as well. So there is, like, even Quintana's up there at 26%, top oh, two pitchers. What's that? Let me refresh, because when I was looking before – it was only 12% for Quintana. For top two? Oh, oh, I, I was talking about the ownership. My bad. No, yeah, yeah. I'm saying top, I'm saying as far as top two pitcher goes in the top pitchers tool, Quintana's still at 26%, getting 12% ownership. That's why you're seeing such heavy positive leverage on him. Like he's the most positively leveraged pitcher on this three game slate. Yeah, so uh, now I've got everything rerun, taking the most recent ownership into account. John Gray is my lowest owned pitcher on the slate. He's only in 13% of my top 150 lineup. So like, my main rooting interest here is going to be John Gray to get his ass kicked. It's not all that likely. If you guys are playing cash games, they go ahead and play John Gray. But I mean, I find it unlikely John Gray is ever going to warrant 60% ownership on any single individual slate. Quintana is my second least rostered pitcher. But that still means I get to him in about 30% of my lineup. So I'm well overweight to the field on Quintana, even with him being my second lowest on starting pitcher of every single option we have today. Yeah. Man. 
I'm just looking through some of these pitchers. And when you have Gray going up against Oakland, clearly a good spot. No one's going to deny that. Uh, hasn't He has not gotten through four innings this season in two starts. Granted, he did throw 84 pitches last time out, so that might be a little bit misleading. It's not like he was limited to 50 pitches or anything. He threw 84 pitches. He just was wildly inefficient. I don't know, man. I, I, I That ownership is a lot. That is a lot. And, and this is somebody who there was a time where, where he was striking batters out at an impressive clip. You know, he was a mid-20 strikeout, mid-20% strikeout guy. Last season, Gray had a 21% strikeout rate, over 157 innings. This year, he struck out 12% of batters. He's getting swinging strikes at sub-10%, uh, and he's been laboring through innings. I mean, I don't know, dude. I, I, <laughs> I'm not shocked that the Sims is giving you less John Gray than you'd like. Now, I will say this. Anyone that's new to a tool like that is going to have immediate kind of like shock when they see that because they're going to go, wait, this this is, you know, contradictory to everything I've always done. You know, he's 60% owned. That just makes too much sense. He's facing Oakland. In the context of the Sims, what are the reasons that we're getting such little John Gray on a slate like this? ownership and it matters it, it, not that it doesn't matter for other dfs sports it matters so much more for baseball because of how pronounced the leverage situations are so if you're playing a basketball slate for instance there's individual scenarios like let's say a center's out and the starting center like we had the situation earlier in the year with like jackson hayes and christian wood where the center minutes are expected to be split up amongst the Lakers and Christian Wood is super popular. Jackson Hayes isn't yet in that particular scenario. You could say there's leverage in rostering Jackson Hayes because he plays really well and gets the minutes. Those are minutes Christian Wood isn't going to play because they're not likely to share the court together. But in baseball, what happens, not only if you're underweight to a super chalky pitcher like John Gray, could you benefit from him not playing well? But you could directly benefit if you also have Oakland A's players in your lineups as well. So you could have a spot where the entire field on a small slate is rostering John Gray. He is going to be in north of half of the field's lineups. And then in return, almost nobody's going to be rostering the Oakland A's. So if you're rostering the Oakland A's, you, have, you just have such an easier path to winning tournaments. Absolutely. Now, just to be clear, though, it's not strictly ownership. Like, if Spencer Strider was $9,000 against the White Sox and he was 80% owned, you're probably getting 100% Spencer Strider in the Sims. Yeah, the difference, it, and also one thing that's different about some of these small slates or just baseball slates in general, when I'm looking for leverage, the spots that I really like to look for, it's not rostering against chalk starting pitchers that are the best pitchers in baseball it's rostering against guys like john gray yep. who are not very good starting pitchers either bad or mediocre starting pitchers they're just kind of forced be to become chalk by the field because of a lack of other options and then you've got a guy in john gray here who has a 6.14 era and a 9.85 expected era this year and then people will say well he's only pitched seven innings true yeah, it's a very small sample size. There are red flags there, though. His velocity is way down so far. He has a 1.2-mile-per-hour drop in his fastball velocity this year compared to last year. It's down one and a half miles from a couple of years ago. He's 32 years old. He's had a bunch of injuries in his career. There's a lot of reasons to think that John Gray is just not going to be a very good pitcher this year. The other side of this also is that John Gray wasn't great last year. He wasn't as bad as this, but he had a 4.12 ERA, a 4.48 expected ERA. His strikeout rate was 21.6%, which is the lowest mark of his career. So there's been a downward trajectory for John Gray as is. The issues I have with John Gray, it's not solely the ownership. It's ownership going to a pitcher who is not very good. And the A's offense is also terrible. It's very bad. But this is where the ownership comes into play. It's not as bad as what the ownership suggests, and John Gray isn't as good as the ownership suggests. 1,000%. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that, like, the Sims aren't just going to nuke you down to zero exposure on high-owned guys if they're, even in baseball, if they're legitimately great spots. But this is not the case. I mean, look at this. and Look at the tools here. Look at the top pitcher tool. By the way, uh, links to everything in the description, too, and in chat. Jordan can throw them in there. Uh, MLB Sims, all access Sims, 
data only lineup generator a week a month whatever you guys want like we have something for anybody here uh, preeminent tools in the industry the best stuff out there baseball tools uh top stack top pitcher ownership player projections premium discord all of that stuff even if you didn't want to use the sims all of these other tools or the lineup generator going to take you a long way in your process and it's a guarantee you'll be making better lineups than you're building by hand and that's no you know disrespect it's just the way it is and well, the screenshots have kind of spoken for themselves. But think about this. Look at the top stack. And by the way, if you do sign up, Greg's tutorials are so helpful, man. Like when you first did those tutorials and our Sims were brand new, I sat down and watched every single one of them. They're really good, really good. And our DMs are open. You ever have any questions, hit us up. No need to just like dive in head first, even though the learning curve is pretty small. Uh, look on Fandle. Top pitcher probability. Gray. 19%, Hunter Brown, 19%, Brady Singer, 18%, Alan Wynan, 17%, Quintana, 15%, JP Sears, 13%. That's nuts. And there was, who was it in the chat? I think it was Jake Swales. Where was it? Had said somebody must have really high top pitcher odds. It was uh let's see. yeah all right so jake swell said singer's percentage being the top pitcher on the slate has to be over 50 percent. it's not it is very spread out it is uh 18 percent for Spr like like uh, lofty just said it's 18 percent for springer it's 19 percent for john gray it's 19 percent for hunter brown and the ownership is also a little bit more spread out than i thought it was going to be on Fanduel. i thought john gray would be picking up a little bit more of the bulk of the ownership also one of the reasons i think this is a better DraftKings slate than fanduel because DraftKings you could get a lot more leverage at pitcher whereas fanduel is a little bit more spread out uh relative to what the ownerships are on fanduel i actually feel better about john gray as an option there because he's only 29 percent owned as opposed to the 60 percent he's getting on dk yeah sure big difference single pitcher site yes what about Winans? we haven't really talked about him so the uh, positive is that he's going up against the Mets. The other positive is that he's not picking up uh, Uber ownership like some of the other starting pitchers are. And he is currently my third most rostered pitcher. So I'm getting a little bit overweight to the field on Winans. Let's look at some of his numbers, though. So Alan Winans. And also, we're going to have to look at some of his minor league numbers as well to make some uh, inferences because... He is a career minor league pitcher who has no sample size at the major leagues. He made yeah, six thir starts last 32 year. 32 innings. Yeah. They were they were fairly shitty last year. They had a uh well actually it, it's they weren't that bad. He struck out like 24% of batters. His actual underlying numbers are better than John Gray's. Yeah. If we're just looking at last year's numbers. John Gray is get look, John Gray isn't getting this ownership because he's superb. He's getting this ownership because they're the biggest favorite on the slate, and he's facing Oakland. They're, that's what it is. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Winan's numbers from last year, a lot of people might get caught up on the 5.29 ERA. I get it. It's a very shitty mark. His underlying numbers were fairly decent, though. 4.24 expected ERA, 4.09 FIP. You had mentioned law if you generated strikeouts, 24.1%. If you look at the minor league numbers for Winans as well, they're pretty solid. Uh, in previous years, he had a 2.85 ERA, 3.87 FIP in AAA last year. He, It's hard to find data from years before because of the years where there, there were no minor league games. But from looking at just his projections, his numbers, I don't think he's terrible at all. If you look at Steamer, as not projected as a guy with a fair town level 3.78 ERA this year. The bat has him 3.65 ERA. This is projection for an entire season. So, yeah, I'm, I'm overweight to the field on Allen Winans. The one thing that gives you pause is that his average fastball velocity last year, 90 miles per hour. He's an unranked prospect. So he's not somebody that rates out as being a particularly great starting pitcher. But I think there's enough data to suggest he's serviceable and he's in a good matchup against the Mets at relatively modest ownership considering a three-game slate. So uh, Allen Winans, if we're looking at some of the uh, lower-owned pitchers, I, I think he's somebody to be overweight to. By the way, our highest, our highest rated 
prop right now on Odd Shopper. Jose Quintana under four and a half strikeouts on FanDuel, minus 128. We had the true odds at minus 147 there. So Pinnacle's got it at minus 189, circa minus 155. Fandle's standing out here on this one, but I don't really know. Like, I'll bet that for sure, but I don't really know how much. I don't know how much any of that matters for, for DFS today. I really don't. Like, Sears was under five and a half, minus 180. Essentially, all of these guys, like, where's actually, let me look up John Gray's props right now. Actually, very interested to see what these are. Yeah, I'm pulling it up right now, too. Well, first, I'm going to bet the Quintana prop as well. Yeah, I just hit it. Okay, so I'm going into FanDuel right now just to see what their props are. Yeah, we have John Gray uh, under five and a half strikeouts plus 108 on FanDuel. DraftKings, you can get uh, six and a half, but the over on that is plus 140. So, yeah, under under is 184 on six and a half. So, yeah, you're looking at around six strikeouts for John Gray. It almost seems high. Yeah, so Quintana. Uh, what did you say the fair odd projection we had is on? Minus Quintana? 145 under four and a half Ks. Yeah. Oh, that's why. How did, who is who is Jorge Quintana? You had the wrong Quintana. <laughs> yeah, I'm like looking at like who the who the fuck is Jorge Quintana? But that was the <laughs> that was the player card I actually pulled up. But yeah, I mean none of these none of these K props are are popping. So I, I don't I don't really know how much. Let's see what Singer's at. Singer, wow. All right. His K prop sitting at three and a half. How about that, Greg? Three and a half right now on Brady Singer. So clearly he doesn't speak great about his fantasy upside. No. And you know that skepticism that we were going back and forth on? Reason to be skeptical if you've got now, granted, like sometimes there's just unknown quantities, uh, uh, but Three and a half, it just over minus one fifty. But still, we have we have the true odds minus one thirty two over three and a half Ks for Brady Singer. That's somewhat concerning. It's it's a it's a low mark. It's not a surprisingly low mark though. And also, I thought it would context... be four. I thought it'd be four and a half. I did. <laughs> in the context of a three game baseball slate, it doesn't necessarily make him unplayable. Because people will be like, hey, what is his upside then? I mean, the, the winning, the, the the top scoring pitcher on this league could very well score 13 fantasy points yep. today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not taking anything away from that play. I just, it's interesting. Uh, I do, uh, let's, let's, we got still 10 minutes here. Take a few looks at bats. I think we've covered pitching uh, and just kind of the overall strategy on a slate like this. So, ran the Sims on my side. I know you've done the same. Jordan. Jordan, I assume you ran it again since since we got the update. Cool. <laughs> from from the clouds. Uh, all right. With, so, with energy and confidence. I know. Like I'm <laughs> like I asked him something that he's annoyed by. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I yeah I'll, do, I'll do my laundry later, Dad. <laughs> uh Texas. Oakland, it is funny how much Oakland I'm getting, but it's a lot of three-man stacks. It's a lot of three-man, five-man Texas, Atlanta, and the Atlanta is, and and Houston, believe it or not, and K Kansas City, are three teams that I'm not getting a, a particularly large amount of right now. Yeah, I mean the team I have the most exposure to mentioned before is uh, it's the Oakland A's. Uh, they just shit ton of Oakland lineups, and my all my top ROI projected lineups are some form of an Oakland stack, whether it be five man or a three man stack with an Atlanta primary or a Texas primary, or some of it's like uh, four two two stack or three three stacks, things along those lines. 
All my top projected stacks are Oakland ones. As far as the other offenses, though, the two teams outside of Oakland I get the most of are the Houston Astros and the Atlanta Braves. And that's simply just because that's where the best play, the actual real best players on the slate are from Houston and Atlanta. Yep. Those are the that's the best place to spend your your remaining salary. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then just looking at like individual exposures, Seth Brown, Toro Seeger, um, not not pitchers obviously, but a good amount of Oakland and Texas exposures, decent amount of individual Mets exposures, not a ton of stacks. Twenty eight percent Jordan Alvarez. You're never going to turn your nose at that. By the way, the new layout on on the Sims is sweet. Being able to just toggle between positions, what a difference that makes. It's good. It's it's helpful for it's definitely helpful for content. Yeah, damn right it is. When you and I are doing the Sims show for NFL every Friday and Jacob doesn't have to be and Jordan don't have to be going in doing wild stuff, just toggle between positions, it's it's nice. But um actually, I'm getting are you still getting J.P. Sears as your highest exposed pitcher? Yeah, I have him in uh, 45% of my lineup. So J.P. Sears, and once again, it's all due it's all due to leverage reasons. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but I'm actually getting a good amount of Hunter Brown on this side. Yeah, I have I have two pitchers in north of 40% of my lineups. One of them is Hunter Brown. The other one is J.P. Sears. So there, there's like tiers to the pitchers, right? So in terms of my exposures, it's like it's Sears if you're looking to save salary. And I know that none of the pitchers are remarkably expensive or anything. But in terms of top pitcher to save salary with for me, it's J.P. Sears. Top pitcher to pay up for Hunter Brown. That's like my tier one. Tier two then is Brady Singer to pay up for. Alan Winans is a punt option. And then if we're looking at the cheap guys, Jose Quintana, who I'm like double the field on, he's somebody who's showing up in a chunk of lineups for me and then just like aggressively underweight to uh, Jose Quintana. I actually just noticed because of how uh, much ownership John Gray has and the amount underweight I am to him, I'm overweight to every single pitcher on the slate that isn't John Gray and then just way underweight to Gray. Before we go, we still have a few minutes. Maybe this will help you guys out. Pull up the lineup generator, see what exposures look like there. Nice. It's easy. You can swap players, lock players, decide your stack types, all of that stuff. Right. Um, and then save the lineups you like, discard the ones you don't like. Uh, it's super help for sure. You can see how, like, w as far as ownership goes, how chalky it is, what the optimal projection is, all of that stuff. Uh, so let's take a look at that. And by the way, as I've told you guys a million times, sleeper $500 first match deposit bonus and a free square today. Jump in on that free square if you have it. If you're a new user, it's a – who is it? It's a, it's a basket. I think it's Sabonis, like over half a point or something. So free square plus $500 first match deposit bonus plus the dynamic pricing, which allows you to take home runs, stolen bases, doubles, triple doubles in basketball, uh, touchdowns in, in, in football, way different. And you can up to 100 extra entry. But more than anything, just a massive sign-up bonus – and a free square for anyone new that jumps onto the site. Link in the description and in the chat for Sleeper. All right, so Jordan ran, let's see, Greg. Jordan ran 20 or saved 20 lineups. And our highest, let's see if, if it looks the same. 73% Texas stacks as far as exposure goes. So my, are you looking at, uh, just, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is going to be from all, could you go back to the player exposures for a second, Jordan? I'm kind of curious just to look at some of the lineups and see what the stack composition is. Meaning are these mostly four man stacks? It's kind of hard to tell just from looking through it, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that at least from here, because it, it is different. Usually there's more synchronicity between the Sims and the the lineup generator, but these are like, these are pretty different results in terms of exposures. For sure. Still a lot of Hunter Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, I was getting a lot of Texas bats as well. I will say though, I didn't get nearly as much Sears as you did on the Sims. I was getting like 15%. So that's a little bit different, but the biggest thing that stands out to me is the John Gray exposure. That's the biggest thing for me from the Sims to the lineup generator. Yeah. 
for sure the biggest the biggest factor here. And another thing too is it's where the Sims is going to be taking, you know, like, oh, it's going to be taking more factors into consideration, building out more lineups as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, John Gray is showing up in a bunch of these lineups here, and that is uh, not how I'm playing the slate. Bobby B said Mets Braves delayed now too. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. That, that is, that's less of a concern for me. There's rain there and I'm not going to say it's a hundred percent safe, but I don't think it, I don't think the most likely scenario is that the game gets canceled or anything. Yeah. They have plenty of time to play this one out. Plus didn't yesterday's get postponed too, or was that the day before I, my days run together? Yeah, it was yesterday. I'll pull up the, uh, the old Atlanta weather. If if yesterday's got, the, they're going to try to do like Philly's got delayed earlier, you know, a week ago, got postponed, sorry. And then they ended up taking a one o'clock game, pushing it all the way back to seven 30, but they played it anyway. So um, yeah, my guess is that this, that, that ultimately in the end they'll play. Uh, let's see. How bad does it look? Doesn't even look bad. It's raining. It just, if they if they wait it out, they could clearly end up playing it because later tonight there's no chance of rain. There's a they might have to wait a little bit to get it in, but if they want to play, they certainly can. If you look at by the time we get to five p.m., there's no chance of rain basically for the rest of the night. In Atlanta, I, as a self-proclaimed amateur meteorologist myself i think they'll be good to go in 45 minutes i think they will be good also but i'm saying that like even if the rain lingers there's just no chance of rain later if they wanted to wait it out. yeah they'll play today i'm not fate this isn't one of those games that, that you would think has a high risk of postponement and if it does don't blame me i don't know shit about weather anyway greg g Ehrenberg dfs anything else before we get out of here for the day uh new promo starting for ufc 300 if you guys want to check out any of our mma packages if you sign up with the promo code 300 there's links for that below you are going to get 30 percent off any package you want to sign up for whether it's the sims package or a data package uh check out our mma stuff especially if you guys want to play the ufc 300 slate it should be a really really fun card yeah man we got stuff going on all the time all the links in the description and in chat also in for sleeper 500 dollar match free square and some bonus Appreciate you guys hanging out as always. Hey, have a good rest of the day. Enjoy some baseball. Come back later on tonight for some basketball, and we'll run it all back tomorrow to close out the week. Peace.